Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome. I want to start promptly because that way you'll have more time to go back to the bar after the short program. Thank you all so much for coming. You've made it tonight to the seventh annual New York Benefit for the Fine Arts Work Center. I am Michael Roberts. I'll applaud myself. Wonderful to have you all here, and we thank you all for coming. This is the, what, about the fifth time I've done this and the seventh time we've had this benefit, but it is a very, very special year, as some of you or maybe all of you know. This is the 50th anniversary of the Fine Arts Work Center. We have an amazing year of celebratory activities coming up. You'll hear more about some of them tonight and more as time goes by. But the thing I want to tell you is that we are also having a critically important fundraising campaign. And what this is about is a chance to make the second half century of this organization less precarious and scary than the first, particularly in the financial respect, because wonderful things have happened for 50 years on the creative side, and we've, you know, we've sort of run behind trying to catch up on the financial side. And uh, we also look forward to making those spaces that you all remember probably as nicer than they actually are, or nicer than they are now. We're going to move out of shabby chic into something a little, a little more, not elegant, never elegant on Cape Cod. But seriously, this is about expanding resources for the talented, creative artists and writers who have come to the Work Center for 50 years, and also safeguarding and improving those spaces that you do remember, those 24 apartments uh, and those 10 spectacularly large studios. Uh, with very shaky lighting, as you may remember. Anyway, it's a goal that is beyond anything Falk has ever attempted up to now. Five million dollars, gas, three and a half million for our endowment, supporting the fellowship, and a, a million and a half for our buildings and spaces. We need the help of every person in this room and uh, if you care about this spit of land and all of this creativity that has been such a part of it for so long, you will do whatever you can for as long as you can. Some of, all of you can do a little, and some of you can do a lot. So please remember the campaign. You'll be hearing more about it. I want to give special thanks tonight to Robert De Niro Jr., who is not here, but we miss him, and we want to thank the amazing, friendly, and supportive staff here at the Tribeca Grill. As you all know, let's hear it for the team. I think you all know by now that this is a beautiful space that is associated with a splendid artist who got his start with Hans Hoffman in the Day's Lumberyard. Uh, and it's now the Falk headquarters, for anybody who doesn't know. And he went on to become the father of a great actor. But our being here salutes the founding generation of which he was a part. Some, I think it, there might even be one uh, artist of that uh, vintage here tonight. Some happily still at work. And uh, that vision helped create Falk 50 years ago, and it has sustained it since. I also want to thank our chairs, Ted Chapin and Torrance Boone, an incredibly generous host committee that is represented here tonight by a number of you, and all of you present. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, so you all know that this is about celebrating the fellowship and that we have been uh, able to send a thousand artists and writers out into the world. Tonight we especially spotlight the writers. Come back in May for the visual artists. Eight of our writers, have, as you probably all know, have won the Pulitzer Prize. Well, two of them are here tonight with us as special guests. Jhumpa Lahiri and Tayahemba Jess. Let's give them a welcoming hand. We also have a large number of fellows here. You're supposed to be wearing lanyards, but just in case you're not, hold up your hands so everybody can see how many of you are here. Let's hear it for the artists. 
And as I said, come back to Boston on May 4th, which is a Friday, and you'll see a wonderful show of visual art representing, I think, 25, quite a number of past fellows. Uh, and that will be a, a spectacular event. It's at the Boston Center for the Arts in the South End. Uh, Lori Bookstein, who I think may be here tonight, is curating the show. So uh, come back. Many other outstanding events all summer. So come and uh, come often. Uh, so let me just introduce the two people who are going to present tonight's honorees. Major Jackson, unfortunately, is stuck on a mountaintop in Vermont where there was snow. He actually sent me a video of his wheels spinning uh, on the mountain just so I would, you know, give him a slip for his absence. Uh, but he sends his serious regrets. He, as most of you know, has chaired the writing committee for the last, I think, five years. It has the all-important role of superintending the jury process that selects our writing fellows. So we owe a special debt of thanks to Major and all the people who work on that, some of whom are here. Um, now, I'm very happy that we do have a, a much better than second best choice tonight <laughs> to introduce uh, our, one of our uh, honorees, Marie Howe. <laughs> The author of four volumes of poetry, of which the most recent, Magdalene Poems, was long listed for the National Book Award. He al she also co edited a, a book of essays in the company of my solitude, American writing from the AIDS pandemic. Her poems have appeared in many important places, including The New Yorker, The Atlantic, Poetry, Agni, and Plowshares. She's a chancellor of the Academy of American Poets. And in 2012, she was named the Poet Laureate of New York State. Please welcome Marie. So, um, hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Can you gather a little closer? Thank you so much. Where is Tanimba? Come here. Come here. You have to, you have to stand in front of me. So Major Jackson. Um, uh, wrote uh, this beautiful piece, but before I read, um, he wrote a lot, so I'm not going to read the whole thing um, because Major is verbose. We're joking. We love Major. Um, but I want to say that Tahimba Jess was a student in my class in 2003 at NYU. And, you know, he won the Pulitzer Prize and I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> What gives? And not only that, but really, truly, to him, but you walked in and you were already full blown artist. I mean, I, I, I got the chills thinking about you. You did. You walked in, you were writing those left belly poems, and it was there. It was all there. There was nothing to tell him except more, more, more. That was it. So it's, it's really moving for me to see you here and to celebrate you. Um, Really. So, here's what Major said. Between the world and you, meaning us, is the artist. And when that artist has enough music inside his body to render language his instrument, which he's going to do in a minute, right? You're going to render language your instrument? Um, <laughs> capturing the blues cadences of history and the genius of American survival and imagination, then that artist is Tohemba Jess, author of two heralded collections of poetry, Lead Belly and Olea, is that how you say it? I'm so afraid to say it wrong. The, he is, which, was the, the, which won the 2017 Pulitzer Prize. Pride. The 2017 Pulitzer Pride and Prize. Um, and, then, and then Major goes on to delineate what he wants to celebrate about Tohemba, and he says one, Although Tehemba Jess is a celebrated poet and former slam poet whose blues-tinted performances have delighted many, he is as much a historian and scholar. From Henry Box Brown to blind Tom Wiggins to the McCoy twins in his verse, Tehemba finds ways of honoring the arcana of hidden figures who quest for spiritual and physical freedom, whose quest 
for spiritual and physical freedom is emblematic of the American journey. Um, he wants to celebrate how Tehimba just acknowledges the blessing of our coexistence. And he quotes Tehimba, um, who said in an interview on NPR, we ride the wake of each other's rhythm, beating our hearts syncopated tempo with music all our own, with our mouths seeped in the glow of hand-me-down courage. Hand-me-down courage. And finally, three, he wants to celebrate to him his generosity. Um, he says, although not an official member of the writing committee, why is that to him? <laughs> the long story. Okay. Um, although he is not an official member of the writing committee of the Fine Arts Book Center, he has served as a jurist over multiple years since his fellowship year, spending long hours reading applicant submissions and traveling to Provincetown to deliberate over the next generation of fellows. Um, between the world and you is to him the Jess, a native Detroiter, uh, the winner of the National Poetry Series Prize, the winner of the Pulitzer Prize, the recipient of the Ansfield Wolf Book Award, the Whiting Fellowship, the Lennon Literary Award, and a National Endowment of the Arts Literature Fellowship. Um, a poet whose textured lyricism is born of the beautiful kinship between me and you, giving credence to what Etheridge and I called the formulation of the trinity of art. The poem, the poet, and the people. Please welcome to him, Jeff. Uh, one of those uh, circular moments where uh, things are coming together after a circle because Marie, as, as she said, uh, I was in rapt attention in her classes at NYU and I, uh, I, was, I was taking notes on not just how to be a poet but how to, how to work with students in a class and, um, and learning so much from her, her, her work as well as from Major Jackson who uh, was in the room when my name was being bantered about, apparently, at the Fine Arts Work Center and the admissions process, and I owe him a huge debt of gratitude for being in my corner and, uh, and uh, back for me. And uh, also, I gotta say, you know, Fine Arts Work Center, to, to break it down, when I applied for my, uh, a fellowship at Fine Arts Work Center, it was really pretty much a long shot. I was playing all the long shots that I possibly could at the time. It was like me and my grad, last year, my uh, grad year at uh, NYU. Um, I, I spent every dime I could on uh, entry, entry fees for poetry contests and the rest on uh, fellowships, et cetera. And I was like, yo, brother need a job. <laughs> you know? But I didn't know anything about applying for a job either. Right? Just that whole world was completely new to me. And um, uh, I, everything, everything had said no. I mean, this fellowship said no, that one said no, this contest said no, that contest that said no. And then at the very end of my uh, academic year, I got the notice from Fine Arts Works Center. And it was like a, it was like a, like a lifeboat in a raging sea of uncertainty. Yo, I got a place to chill for seven months. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And not deal with this New York rent. And, <laughs> and also, I was, I was psychologically completely exhausted from being going through my MFA and just like really, I didn't realize how exhausted I was until I, I, I had this old station wagon, it was like an 87 Toyota Camry wagon with probably a million miles on it, with no, no radio and no air conditioner. I put all my stuff in and I, and I moved up to, uh, to my little place in Fine Arts Work Center. And when I got there, I was like, okay, I don't know, maybe I had like $400 in my pocket if anything. I was like, okay, now I can, I can get a meal, you know what I'm saying, and chill for a while and camp out until I make the next move. That I just, it, I was, it was necessary to have that space. And I'm just really, really glad to be here to celebrate Fine Arts Work Center's 50th year, uh, making things like this happen. 
and possibilities like this happen. So um, I want to thank you for coming out and celebrating Fine Arts Work Center with me. And uh, thank you, Marie, and, and uh, my man Major, back in the snow, <laughs> you know. But uh, thank you very much for coming out and celebrating. To introduce our second honoree, I am delighted to introduce my predecessor, who is back, I'm thrilled to say, as president of the Fine Arts Work Center, Margaret Murphy. Yes. Margaret, let's give her a hand. Many of you knew her or know her. She was uh, brilliantly our director from, from 2007 until 13, or almost 13. You know, Margaret worked as an environmental lawyer for a prestigious New York firm until she was 50 years old. And at that point, uh, she switched to the side of the angels where she has been <laughs> for more than two decades supporting important and worthwhile nonprofit organizations in many ways. She uh, left the private sector to found a nonprofit legal services group for older New Yorkers in need. She, uh, since departing the work center in, in 2012, she's become indispensable to no less than three other Provincetown nonprofits. Uh, one you know very well, which is Provincetown Arts Magazine, where she's on the board. The new Provincetown Commons, which if you haven't heard about it, is a wonderful new organization that you will hear a great deal about in the old community center. It will be in the community center. And finally, her own brainchild, Trees Provincetown, which is a nonprofit dedicated to conserving and extending the arboreal heritage of Provincetown. So, welcome, please, my dear Margaret. Our next honored guest is our beloved Jubilahiri. What you need to know about her for the moment, other than that she is one of our most accomplished fellows, is that her mother tongue is Bengali, her next language is English, and her new language is Italian, which she has been writing in for five years now and has described as her new love. My dear friend Salvatore Scabona has a few words to say, and so do I. Giulpa arrivò al Fine Arts Works Center nel 1997. Era una borsista tipica, una aspirante scrittrice di 30 anni che aveva completato anni di studi accademici specialistici senza aver pubblicato niente e senza alcun riconosc riconoscimento. Quando sette mesi dopo la show Provincetown continuava a non aver pubblicato nulla né aveva ricevuto alcun riconoscimento ma aveva un notevole manoscritto e continuava a distinguersi tra i suoi colleghi borsisti per tutto il tempo quel manoscritto fu pubblicato un anno dopo che lei lasciò Provincetown e l'anno successivo vinse il premio Pulitzer <ride> per la narrativa il libro un, una raccolta di racconti intitolata l'interprete dei malanni ha venduto oltre 50 milioni di copie in tutto il mondo in 35 lingue <ride> Jumpa arrived in Provincetown in 1997. She was a typical writing fellow, a 30-year-old aspiring writer 
who had completed years of graduate studies with nothing published and no recognition. When she left Provincetown seven months later, she still had nothing published and no recognition, but she had a remarkable manuscript, and she went on to distinguish herself among her fellows and her fellow fellows for all time. She won the Pulitzer Prize in fiction for that manuscript. It was published a year after she left Provincetown, and it won the Pulitzer Prize a year after that. The book, a collection of stories titled Interpreter of Maladies, has sold over 15 million copies worldwide in 35 languages. <laughs> da quando ha vinto il premio Pulitzer all'età di 32 anni per un libro scritto presso il Fine Arts Work Center di Provincetown, Giuba ha pubblicato tre opere di narrativa largamente applaudite: L'omonimo, Una nuova terra e La moglie e più recentemente due opere di saggistica che ha scritto in italiano. In altre parole è Il vestito dei libri. Ha tradotto due romanzi dall'italiano, Lacci e Scherzetto, entrambe opere dell'autore Domenica Starnone. Il suo primo romanzo in italiano, Dove mi trovo, sarà pubblicato quest'autunno. Oltre al Pulitzer, ha ricevuto numerosi premi, incluso il premio Pen Hemingway, una medaglia umanistica nazionale, una borsa di studio Guggenheim, <ride> il premio Pen Malmud per l'eccellenza nel racconto e il premio internazionale di, Avere, di Via Reggio. Giumpa insegna scrittura creativa all'Università di Princeton e vive a Roma quando non si trova a Brooklyn. Since, since winning the Pulitzer at the age of 32 for a book written at the Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Jumpa has published three widely acclaimed works of fiction, The Namesake, Unaccustomed Earth, and The Lowland, and most recently, two works of nonfiction that she wrote in Italian, in other words, and The Clothing of Books. She has translated two novels from the Italian, Ties and Trick, both works of the author Domenico Starnone. Her first novel in Italian, Dove Mi Trovo, will be published this fall. In addition to the Pulitzer, she has received numerous awards, including the Penn Hemingway Award, the National Humanities Medal, a Guggenheim Fellowship, the Penn Malamud Award for Excellence in the Shirt Story, and the Via Reggio International Prize. Jumpa teaches creative writing at Princeton and lives in Rome when not in Berlin. Thank you for being here with us this evening, Jumpa. What a gift. This has been the first time I've ever been honored in two languages in one <laughs> moment, in one space. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I'm really, um, I'm so honored to be here and uh, I'm going to put this bag down. <laughs> um, the Fine Arts Work Center honors me every day. I think that's what it does. Uh, to the people who receive fellowships. Um, I wanted to actually start my, uh, I didn't prepare anything, but I, I wanted to say a few things, and I want to start with a few things I say by a very brief reading, actually, of, uh, of this novel uh, just out um, called Trick by um, Domenico Starnone, who is my good friend and um, 
and I think uh, the best Italian writer at work today. Um, this, one of the reasons this novel struck me, struck such a chord in me, is, um, well, first of all, it's about an artist. It's about a Neapolitan illustrator who is um, nearing the end of his life and uh, is reflecting about, uh, reflecting on his life, his path as a writer, his, his um, you know, the work of becoming, uh, sorry, of an artist, the work of becoming an artist, uh, what, what that is, um, in addition to the art itself, um, th that journey, uh, and, and, and it is a novel, um, and at the risk of promoting recent work, it is, it is truly a, an incredible novel, so profound, um, about this, this idea of um, what it means to, to be born as a writer, to give birth to oneself as a writer, and, and, and it contains very moving passages about, literally about the making of art, about making images, about drawing. Um, so I recommend it to, to all of you. In any case, this is, I'm just gonna read a paragraph, um, and then I'll explain uh, why. Um, so basically, the, the, the protagonist, this illustrator, has come, he's from Naples, and then he, he grows up in Naples, and then he moves away from Naples, and goes to live in Milano, um, but he's called back to take care of his grandson for a couple of days. And so he finds himself back in the house of his, of his family, where he was raised, where he grew up, um, his, his family home in Naples. And he's wandering around the house, which has sort of changed. I gather the way the Fine Arts Work Center is going to change when I go back to visit it um, after all of these res renovations. But he, he's, he goes back and he's, he's experiencing the past, right, the impact that, that any of us who, has ever, who have ever gone away and then returned to a place so this is the, the passage I want to share. Um, he's, um, he goes out onto the balcony, okay? Um, a little balcony in, a, in an apartment in Naples, so a place not much larger than probably this podium. It was a place that used to frighten my mother. She would approach it carefully and didn't want my younger siblings to go there alone. I opened the brand new glass door the balcony was anomalous. All the balconies on that side were. They were shaped like a trapezoid, tapering as they thrust over the void. Ours was on the top floor, the sixth, and maybe this was why my mother, who normally didn't suffer from vertigo, poorly withstood the effect of that tapering, saying that if she looked down, she felt sick. When, some, when somebody needed to be taken in or out, she would call my father. And if my father wasn't there or cranky, she called me, the eldest child. I'd get her what she needed. But then unexpectedly, I'd leap to the far end of the balcony and I'd start to jump, causing the platform and the railing to vibrate and look at her, framed by the doorway while she laughed and was terrified at the same time. I liked that semblance of risk. When I was a boy, I used to sit on the balcony, especially in spring, settling down to read, to write, to draw. The sky had been huge, I remembered, and you could see the spires of the new station. There, over that expanse, I felt like a guard in a tower, or a sentinel at the top of a majestic tree, waiting for the sight of something unknown. I think it should be obvious from that brief passage why I wanted to share it with you tonight, you who all uh, know Provincetown and, and understand uh, how it is metaphorically that very balcony, that tapering, that physical tapering of land. And when you get there, you're a little bit scared because you're far away from the real world and the safe world and the secure world where everything seems to, seems to protect you. Um, you're, you're sort of in the middle of the ocean. Um, you are in the middle of the ocean. And so there's that precariousness. And, and yet there's also that sky and that vision and that vista and that sense of freedom and liberty that is, that is boundless. And this, this, in this novel, it's, it's this space that the, that the illustrator character, who is sort of a stand-in for 
Domenico himself, which is why I keep saying writer when it's really artist, but you know, the same thing. Um, I think this is a very deep passage, you know, in, in, and it made me reflect, it made me think immediately of, um, of the necessity of the artist to find one's balcony and to occupy it and, and to understand both the great risk of occupying that, that tapered space in the middle of nowhere and also to to embrace it and to be brave and to and to stand out there. And I think that um, I think that my time in Provincetown um, it, it was the first thing that put me out there. Um, I told this story before, but I was you know I was terrified to go to Provincetown. I was so ambivalent about it. Um, I didn't know what it would mean or what, what, where it would take me. It didn't seem like the predictable thing to do, but I did it anyway. And, um, and I, in some sense, I, I, I've never left. Um, as I said, this is the gift of Province Town, that it doesn't send you back in May. Um, you, you think you're driving off the Cape, but you really aren't, um, at least for me. This is the this is the reality, and I think any place that that marks you profoundly, and there have been two for me in my life. One was one was Robinstown, and then and then Rome, um, many years later. And I'm not in either of those places physically at the moment. Uh, as you can see, I live in Princeton, New Jersey. In fact, very different from both of those places. But I think when a place marks you as deeply as that, you never. It never leaves you because it becomes a part of you and it gives you strength and, and, and perspective and a positioning um, no matter where you are and what you're doing. And I think I think um, that that is um, something I never expected in my life um, and I, I don't know how to express the gratitude that I feel uh, for having been given. Um, that opportunity. We were talking, um, we've been talking about languages, we've been hearing two languages. Um, and, and you were just saying uh, about, like, we were talking about language and community, language being community, right? And I think, um, you know, yes, at, at the moment I'm very um, involved with my, my Italian uh, journey and the language and, and all, the, all of the doors that that's opening to me. Uh, and, the, and that new horizon, um, but I think really it's the first language that I really connected to um, it wasn't Bengali or English, but the language that's spoken here, the language spoken amongst creative people. And so when I went to, to Provincetown at the age of 30, I finally was in that 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 language, you know, that I knew that I was seeking somehow, um, that I was missing. Um, but once you find it, it is it's such a powerful recognition, right? Um, and that's what I feel. That's what I felt even coming into the room this afternoon and just talking to people. Some are people I've known. Some are fel former fellows I've known over the years. I've met. I've, spend time with other people I don't know but I feel like when I when I go when I go <laughs> back to the cave physically or when I when the cave comes to me it's that sense of it's that language right that um, that is being spoken um, so so I want to thank the Fine Arts Work Center and I want to especially thank Roger Skillings for making that phone call <laughs> convincing me to accept this gift that I was too foolish to understand the value of when it was given to me. Um, it changed my life forever. And um, needless to say, I, I, I would not be standing here if it weren't for that phone call. And I mean, it seems like everyone says that when they stand up in these, you know, behind the podium. but. That's a very profound thing when you think about it. When I think about it, it's a very profound thing to think that I would not be here if it were not for that phone call. Um, so even though 
I hope when I go back to the work center, everything isn't renovated to the point where I'm having um, nightmares of this character at that point um, is haunted by um, the renovations. Uh, I'm sure there'll be tasteful and important <laughs> um, types of renovations. Um, I, I perhaps will remain nostalgic for the bucket I used to put under the skylight of the barn. <laughs> Um, but again, these are things that one carries within forever. So um, please give generously to this wonderful place. Thank you. Thank you, Jumpa, so much. And have no fear. You will recognize it when you come back. <laughs> to close our program, please welcome the co-chair of this event and the co-chair of our Board of Trustees, Ted Chapin. Thank you all. Um, I want to bring your attention, I think there was a copy anyway, of the uh, workbook. Uh, the workbook, we do this workbook every year, but this year it's particularly nice. Uh, graphically gorgeous, uh, supremely informative, and there are plenty of copies, at least one for everyone in this room. Please take one on your way out. Ah, indeed, there it is. And, you know, so much of this uh, workbook is a fantastic uh, catalog of our summer workshop program, also a catalog of our online writing program, but uh, as you thumb through it, you'll see a very helpful list of every single thing that's happening at the Fine Arts Work Center this uh, summer. All the presentations, art talks, uh, uh, music series, etc. at the Kunitz uh, room. There's also a list of every opening and show in the gallery. There's the festivals called out, for instance, our uh, late July, our social justice festival, uh, the much beloved uh, week of poetry, poetry week in August. Um, and then, of course, uh, I want to bring your attention to the special events that are happening for this anniversary year. And I'll just uh, give you a headline on one that is particularly uh, wonderful. Uh, we have as our guest to come celebrate with us a man who is an architect, a curator, a filmmaker, an activist, and by the way, uh, China's most important art artist ever, Ai Weiwei, will be coming to do a custom installation in our gallery in late July. He will also be participating in our social justice week, not only in an interview, but also will be showing his film on global refugee crisis, uh, Human Flow, and it'll wrap up with a great cocktail party in the world. So that, that's just one of the many. I won't tell you about the others because you can read about it here. But there is one thing uh, that I hope you will all read, which is the front section, which is about this, uh, this very campaign. And I, I, uh, I love this quote when I read it. It just popped off the page. Our, uh, here it is. Oh, they over, that is the founders, they overcame modest means and geographic isolation to create an institution that now enjoys international renown. Well, I chuckled when I read that because I thought, let's change it. We still are overcoming <laughs> modest means and geographic isolation. Uh, you know, the Work Center, as you all know, is not founded as many of its peer institutions were by multi-millionaires. In fact, it was founded by artists. Uh, so, look, the, uh, the early years were tough. I remember having dinner with a trustee that was one of the original trustees, or soon after the original trustees. And she was telling me, well, you know, a trustee meeting would be like, oh, here's the electric bill. Who's picking up this this month? I mean, well, uh, rest assured. In 50 years, we have come an enormous way <laughs> since then. I mean, this is a world-renowned institution that is well-managed, uh, that has a budget of $1.7 million a year. We have a priceless collection of real estate in an incredibly expensive real estate market. And we have a modest endowment about the same size as the annual budget. So, you know, we, we make that budget happen every year. There's line items from everything. Uh, largely earned income, and we get the grants. We, we're always trying for grants, but, you know, the core support is the community uh, in all its manifestations, from trustees, well, right to this annual event. And, 
know, I want to thank everyone tonight for helping this fundraiser right here, and particular thanks to the people that come every single year to support this fundraiser. Because I'll tell you, I'm looking at the budget every year, and it's a line item like anything else, New York party. So you know, we, uh, we try to guess what the budget's gonna be, and we hope we'll make the numbers, I believe we're making the numbers this year, but uh, I have to tell you, I forget how many years ago, a few years back, it's the seventh annual uh, party here. Uh, we didn't make our numbers. So, uh, yikes. Uh, and you'd say, and it's a good question, now how does a ten or $20,000 problem, uh, why is that a big wave that rocks the boat of a, a $1.7 million a year budget that's sailed in a long time? Well, <laughs> the trouble is there's, the, there's not enough keel. The, the, the boat's keel is too shallow, and you know, a wave like that comes in and it rocks. So it, it became clear as we're setting out in this next 50-year voyage that this ship, ship, this ship needs a deeper keel. And uh, the trustees started talking about it as early as 2015. Come our 50th anniversary, we really need to reposition this uh, institution for the voyage ahead. So um, we had a pre-launch period all throughout this last year. And the pre-launch was not just to work hard on literature and planning all our events and all that. It was also a pre-launch fundraising campaign because the trustees, the committee involved with trustees and also our uh, inner circle of key supporters and friends, we said to ourselves, let's see if we can, before the launch, raise half of the five million. And I am very, very thrilled to stand before you tonight and be the first one to officially tell you we have succeeded. We have, we have raised $2.5 million in excess of $2.5 million. Yeah, I was telling my uh, committee members, well, you have to realize, as hard as that was, that was the easier 2.5 million. <laughs> no, the, the tougher one is, is ahead of us. So tonight is the, the actual first launch moment of the campaign. And, and so where are we getting this extra 2.5 million? Well, it, it really has to come from the community. I mean, honestly, where else are we gonna look? But um, the, the good news is that this community is way, way larger uh, than you might imagine. I mean, it starts, of course, with the town of Protestant. And you know, what the Fine Arts Work Center gives, both intellectually and financially, to that community is absolutely enormous. But you know, uh, unlike our founders 50 years ago, where they really did suffer geographic isolation, our, our community extends far beyond the boundaries of Provincetown. Uh, for starters, it, we, we have hundreds now of fellows all over the world. And I think there's 25 or 30 in this room yeah. tonight, for starters. Uh, it also extends to all our, our people that have taken workshops uh, and have gone home and with that memory of what this institution meant to them. It's people that stayed home and did our online writing courses. It is also every writer, every visual artist, every poet, and frankly, every supporter of the arts who recognizes what this institution does to nurture the emerging generation of writers, visual artists, and poets. And, you know, this, this community, it, it, it includes Ai Weiwei, who currently lives in Berlin, and it includes all of you. So we're, we're asking all of you to do whatever you can. Uh, you know, the, uh, we're keeping tabs with anything up to a five-year pledge is part of the $2.5 million uh, range. But uh, part of our parallel activity with this campaign is not only to grow the community, but also to uh, seek legacies as well, because you know it's one thing to boost the campaign and boost, I mean, boost the endowment now, but you know the legacies in 10 and 20 years, this is going to keep that endowment growing, and you just know, as we did, ever waves in the future, that's going to come in handy. 
So I ask you all to do what you can if, if you know, legacy and cash isn't your thing. Uh, give a painting for our auction inventory. Or if you can't give a painting, uh, how about just helping our poor overworked staff get through this incredible year with a volunteer, uh, your time and effort. Uh, so that being said, I want to announce the bar is closing today. So whatever you're drinking, make sure you get another before the bar closes. And be sure to pick up one of these on your way out. Thank you all so much for coming. Can I just point out that the two unsung heroines of this evening, my colleagues Beth Warner and Nia Brickers.